Hello there. My name is Tyler Griffin, and this is Scripture Study Insights by Scripture Central. Today, Easter. As we contemplate this most important week of all weeks in the history of eternity as far as, as our salvation is concerned, there are a million directions we could, we could take uh, our study insights. I wanted to focus in today on a couple of things. Number one, amplifying what the scriptures say about the infinite atonement of Jesus Christ, specifically the Book of Mormon because of this year's Come Follow Me curriculum, and secondly, to amplify what our prophets, our modern prophets have said about the infinite atonement of Jesus Christ. There are a lot of theories, there are a lot of uh, ideas circulating out there about different aspects of what Jesus Christ accomplished through his infinite atonement, but it's important to stay rooted in what the Lord has said through prophets, both, both ancient as well as modern. Um, to, to illustrate that, section one of the Doctrine and Covenants, the, the preface to the whole Doctrine and Covenants, listen to these words in verse 14. The Savior said, And the arm of the Lord shall be revealed, and the day cometh that they who will not hear the voice of the Lord, neither the voice of his servants, neither give heed to the words of the prophets and apostles, shall be cut off from among the people. And then towards the end of section one, he gives that famous statement, what I, the Lord, have spoken, I have spoken, and I excuse not myself, and though the heavens and the earth pass away, my word shall not pass away, but shall all be fulfilled, whether by mine own voice or by the voice of my servants, it is the same. So it's this, this beautiful invitation for us to not just see the prophetic voice as another option in a sea of people, in a chorus of many voices telling us what to think or how to believe or how to worship, but rather amplifying that voice of the prophets and the apostles that God has chosen for our day. So that's what we're going to, to do as we explore some principles uh, to study this week of Easter. Now, initially, we need to talk about the, the word itself, the atonement of Jesus Christ. It's, many of you have already seen this, you already understand this, but making sure we're all on the same page. In English, when you put M-E-N-T as a suffix to a word, the dictionary definition of, of M-E-N-T is the process or product of whatever came before. So, in this case, it was William Tyndale who is credited with coining this new word when he, he comes to the Greek word katalage, and most of the time in English it got translated as reconciliation. But I love the fact that William Tyndale took it one step further and created this brand new word from two English words, at one. So, it's the process or product whereby we come to be at one with God, with Jesus Christ, and ultimately with our loved ones, with each other. He is all about this root word of, of the word atonement is one. William Tyndale probably wouldn't have pronounced this atonement. It would have been atonement for him because it's all about unity and oneness and coming together and unifying. So today as we open up these scriptures in the Book of Mormon and look for what what can we gain from a deeper understanding and appreciation for the infinite atonement of Jesus Christ, and what difference will that make in our life moving forward? That's the question we want to keep at the forefront. And it's important to remember, President Nelson has emphasized this, we don't talk about the atonement as if it's this isolated, uh, entity unto itself. 
The atonement doesn't heal anyone. The atonement doesn't forgive. The atonement doesn't save. The atonement is the infinite sacrifice that Jesus Christ performed for us. Thus, it's Jesus Christ who saves through the power of his atonement. It's Jesus Christ who heals, who delivers, who redeems through the means of performing his infinite atonement. So, it's important to remember um, as we hearken to the words of our living prophets that we amplify the fact that it is the atonement of Jesus Christ. It's never an isolated entity unto itself. Now, the other thing to mention before we dive into some scriptures is the reality that sometimes we overlook the significance of Easter. In April 2023 General Conference, there were multiple general authorities and leaders of the church who talked about the significance of Easter regarding our, our worship and our understanding of the gospel. Uh, N.T. Wright, a New Testament scholar, was quoted a couple of times talking about the significance of those chapters in the Bible that refer to the week of the atoning sacrifice. And his point is, is beautifully taken that sometimes in Christianity we put so much emphasis on Christmas and then Easter is just this little minor holiday in the spring, when in reality, he said, if you take away Christmas, you only lose four chapters, Matthew 1 and 2 and Luke 1 and 2. But if you take away the week of the atoning sacrifice, you lose 35 to 40 percent of your New Testament Gospels. Uh, in, in the Gospel of John, uh, you've got seven, eight chapters that are focused on the last 24 hours of Jesus Christ and his suffering and then his, his ultimate resurrection. It is, it is the, the main event of Christ's life. The miracles, the parables, and his teachings, even going back to his baptism, his temptations, and then going all the way back to his birth and all of his experiences there, all of those are pointing forward to the significance of why he was born on this earth, and it was to make intercession or to make his infinite atonement for us. So, that's important to remember as you, you celebrate this week that this, this should be more glorious, this should be more triumphant than any other time of the year for us, uh, this Easter season because of what Jesus Christ overcame for us through the events of his atoning sacrifice. And with that, let's dive in. So, instead of doing a, a lesson on the infinite atonement, instead of covering um, concepts that uh, other people have, have shared regarding the infinite atonement, I wanted to do something a little different following the example of President Dallin H. Oaks when he gave his great talk that we believe the words of Christ, and then he read a whole bunch of scriptures. I want to do that. Scriptures from the Book of Mormon that add beautiful insight and depth to what the Bible teaches regarding the infinite atonement of Jesus Christ. So, we begin in 2 Nephi chapter 9, that incredible talk given by Jacob to the people after he had read to them two chapters from Isaiah. He says this, Yea, I know that ye know that in the body he shall show himself unto those at Jerusalem from whence we came, for it is expedient that it should be among them, for it behooveth the great Creator that he suffereth himself to become subject unto man in the flesh and die for all men, that all men might become subject unto him. Then moving on, in verse 7 he says, Wherefore it must needs be an infinite atonement. Save it should be an infinite atonement, 
this corruption could not put on incorruption. Wherefore, the first judgment which came upon man must needs have remained to an endless duration, and if so, this flesh must have laid down to rot and to crumble to its mother earth, to rise no more. And then he goes on to say, well, if your flesh will rise no more, then what happens to your spirit? And he tells us in verse 8 that our spirit would become subject to that angel who fell from before the presence of the eternal God and become the devil to rise no more. Hence our absolute need for an infinite atonement to help us overcome the most important things that make us separated from God, our physical and our spiritual death. Jacob describes that in verse 10, Oh, how great the goodness of our God, who prepareth a way for our escape from the grasp of this awful monster, yea, that monster death and hell, which I call the death of the body and also the death of the spirit. But there's more. He goes on in describing in verse uh, 21, and he cometh into the world that he may save all men if they will hearken unto his voice. Here we go again. He's saying salvation is, is hinged on our ability and willingness and using our agency to hearken to his voice, the things that he teaches us personally, directly, as well as through his prophets, through his chosen servants. So, going on, he says, For behold, he suffereth the pains of all men, yea, the pains of every living creature, both men, women, and children who belong to the family of Adam. And he suffereth this that the resurrection might pass upon all men, that all might stand before him at the great and judgment day. Now, this is a, this is a beautiful place to pause and, and reflect on the significance of mortal life, the significance of our physical bodies, the significance of the, the creation of the earth and the fall that brought about these conditions in which we live, which then leads to the need for an infinite atonement. Uh, referring back to N.T. Wright, this New Testament scholar who has been quoted in General Conference multiple times, he wrote a book called Surprised by Hope. And in that book, he teaches this beautiful doctrine that aligns beautifully with the teachings of the prophets in the Book of Mormon as well as the prophet Joseph Smith and our modern prophets. He talks about this concept of often in, in Christianity as a whole, people refer to the, the resurrection as this event where Jesus Christ overcomes death and then he goes off to heaven and someday he'll take us from this fallen earth and take us to heaven to live with him there. And N.T. Wright says that that goes against everything the New Testament is teaching about the mission of Jesus Christ. Even in his, his uh, the Lord's Prayer in the Sermon on the Mount, he talks about the kingdom coming to this earth. The, the beautiful point of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is that it matters what we do in our physical bodies, in this fallen mortal world, because God is not intending to one day take us away from this earth and ship us off to heaven to live with him there. God is bringing heaven here. He is going to make earth an outpost of the divine for those who will fully embrace and accept the Savior's infinite atonement for us. God is coming here this will become heavenly. Consequently, as, as you celebrate Easter this week, pay attention to the people around you. Pay attention to the beautiful creation around you. And remember that the glorious promise of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a reassurance that all of these things actually matter that we're engaging with and experiencing here in mortality, and Christ will perfect 
this earth, just like Christ will perfect our bodies, our minds, our souls. He, he will perfect all unrighteousness and in, impurity and make us clean and make us heavenly. That's what the covenant path is all about. Isn't just trying to get somewhere to get to heaven. The covenant path is about building this relationship with Jesus Christ and walking with him as he helps us become more like him until that glorious day when he will bring us into the presence of the Father to be judged gratefully by the Savior himself and then we become one with them as Jesus talks about in his intercessory prayer that as they are one, we can become one with each other and with them. It's this beautiful promise of the coming glory of heaven to the earth for all of us in resurrected bodies so that we don't have to go down to the grave to rise no more or have our spirits become subject to the devil to rise no more. The next one that directly refers to it, Mosiah chapter 3 verse 7, and lo, he shall suffer temptations and pain of body, hunger, thirst, and fatigue, even more than man can suffer, except it be unto death. For behold, blood cometh from every poor, so great shall be his anguish for the wickedness and abominations of his people. So you see that sometimes we refer to the infinite atonement of Jesus Christ as only helping us overcome death and hell that awful monster, but there's so much more involved beyond the, those most important two elements that he, he suffered temptations. In other words, when you're suffering temptation, don't assume that, that the Savior is up in heaven saying, oh, I, I hope that you do okay with that. I'm going to help you with your death and overcoming sin and hell but I can't help you with temptation. That is not the God we worship. The God we worship knows how to help us, how to run to us or succor to us in whatever it is that we're experiencing as an effect of the fall of Adam and Eve. And temptations is one of those. What an amazing power it is, brothers and sisters, when you're in the face of temptation, to not be a victim of that temptation, but to rather call upon the power of the Savior's infinite grace that is offered to us through, by way of, his infinite atonement in our behalf, to call upon his name, to use his name in the moment of temptation and to plead for deliverance. There is a power there that we don't need to just look at it as a solution to our problems. It can be a help to prevent sin as we're going through temptation. Same thing with pain of body, hunger, thirst, and fatigue. All of these, these mortal elements that we experience as the effects of the fall of Adam and Eve, he's able to succor us and help us, which doesn't mean he always takes it away. Often it means he strengthens us so that as we are experiencing those things, we don't just go through them, we don't just endure them and survive them, but we actually grow through them. We actually learn more empathy, more compassion for others so that we can become more like Jesus Christ in the way we treat each other and the way we treat even ourselves uh, with, with more kindness as we go through these, these adversities and afflictions. In chapter 5, verse 7, at the end of King Benjamin's speech, I love how he talks about the outcome, the fruit of the infinite atonement. Because keep in mind, there are three things, three levels you could look at, kind of like scripture study. There's the underlying foundation, that which undergirds the infinite atonement, the, the need for it, the historical setting, all of the, the uh, rationale for why we even need Jesus Christ to come and be born and live a perfect life and perform the infinite atonement in the first place. And then the second layer is the actual events 
of the atonement itself. What did Jesus do? What did he experience? What, what elements of his suffering occurred? And then the third level is, therefore what? What are the fruits that, that come from his suffering? How is it that Isaiah could say, by his stripes we are healed? How does that work? I don't know. I, I know this. I know it works. I know that we are benefited because of Christ's suffering. I don't know all of the mechanics and all of the, the eternal implications of why it works or even how it works, but I know it works from words of the prophets in the scriptures and from living prophets today. We see the fruits of his suffering everywhere we look. So here's one of the, the major fruits that flow from his infinite suffering. Mosiah 5 verse 7, and now because of the covenant which ye have made, ye shall be called the children of Christ. You're now a child of the covenant, a child of Christ, his sons and his daughters. For behold, this day he hath spiritually begotten you. For ye say that your hearts are changed through faith on his name, therefore ye are born of him and have become his sons and his daughters. And as any child who is given a new life and born into a family, that, that child takes upon him or herself the name of the family. As we're born into the covenant, we also take upon us the name of Christ. We don't just take his name upon us, but we have the capacity now to grow up to become like him through the power of his infinite atonement. And you'll notice it's a process as well as a product. Jesus Christ works with us through this long process to create an at one product in the end. That's the, that's the end goal. Skipping over to Alma 34, verse 8 is where we'll start here. And now, behold, I will testify unto you of myself that these things are true. Behold, I say unto you that I do know that Christ shall come among the children of men to take upon him the transgressions of his people. Did you catch that? Christ will come. So, the, the beauty of his birth is amazing. We're not trying to take away anything from Christmas. Keep loving Christmas with all that it, that it brings of, of joy and light and love into the world. That is wonderful. Keep all of that there. The point being, then let's add to it this glorious culmination of why he was even born in the first place. He came into the world among the children of men. Why? To take upon him the transgressions of his people, that he shall atone for the sins of the world for the Lord God hath spoken it. For it is expedient that an atonement should be made, for according to the great plan of the eternal God, there must be an atonement made, or else all, all mankind must unavoidably perish. Yea, all are hardened, all are fallen, and are lost, and must, must perish, except it be through the atonement which is, it is expedient should be made. So it, it's, it's again, you can't get very far in the Book of Mormon before it reminds you of our absolute and utter dependence upon Jesus Christ, our need for access to his infinite atonement in our behalf. If you turn the page over, verse 15 says, and thus he shall bring salvation to all those who shall believe on his name. This being the intent of this last sacrifice, to bring about the bowels of mercy which overpowereth justice. And then down to verse 16, and thus mercy can satisfy the demands of justice and encircles them in the arms of safety. It's my prayer that we will all put more emphasis on what Jesus Christ did for us as we go through this week of the atoning sacrifice this year, that we'll focus on the mercy of God, the arms of, of his safety 
that he offers to encircle us in because he went through that infinite atonement all alone. We don't ever have to be isolated or left alone in any of the mortal conditions, whether it be pain, sickness, affliction, or temptation, or sin needing to be forgiven, or death needing to be resurrected ultimately. Then we jump over to 3 Nephi where Jesus Christ himself is talking about what he accomplished. In 3 Nephi 27, when he gives his description of what the gospel of Jesus Christ is from his own perspective, nobody's interpreting it for us, it's Jesus telling us, this is my gospel, and here's what he says, chapter 27, verse 13. Behold, I have given unto you my gospel, and this is the gospel which I have given unto you, that I came into the world, there's the glorious birth, to do the will of my Father, because my Father sent me, and my Father sent me that I might be lifted up upon the cross, and after that I had been lifted up upon the cross, that I might draw all men unto me, that as I have been lifted up by men, even so should men be lifted up by the Father to stand before me to be judged of their works, whether they be good or whether they be evil. The incredible reality here is Jesus Christ was already judged of your works and of my works, and he was found guilty, and he was punished to the full extent of the law for us. He who had done no wrong, he who deserves zero punishment, suffers infinite punishment and if infinite agonies for us. So, those are just a handful of beautiful scriptures in the Book of Mormon that teach us, give us more depth, more breadth, more angles to look at the Savior's infinite atonement in our behalf, that it doesn't take away from or compete with what we read in the Bible. The Book of Mormon is there to complement and to uphold and to be a joint witness, if to become at one, if you will. There, there's an at one here between the Book of Mormon and the Bible, and then we would add the Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price. They're all one in our hand to testify of these eternal truths. Now, I mentioned at the beginning that I have two scripture study uh, perspectives I wanted to really focus, focus on for this uh, particular set of uh, concepts. The first being to look at what the scriptures say about teachings, and the second was to amplify and magnify what our living prophets have said about the infinite atonement of Jesus Christ. And there are thousands of quotes from general conference and in books and in other talks given by, by leaders of the church, especially by prophets and apostles, I wanted to uh, share a couple of insights from our first presidency and from President Holland, our current prophets and apostles, on things that they have shared regarding this attribute of the Savior's infinite atonement, of his ability and his empathy for us in not just overcoming sin and death, which we've said is the biggest part, the, the awful monster, death and hell, but in some of those often overlooked and forgotten parts of his suffering that have a huge impact on our life regarding our pains, our sicknesses, our afflictions. So the first one I want to share comes from our prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, shared in the Christmas devotional 2023 called, Come, Let Us Adore Him. Listen to these beautiful words. During the past few months, I have learned a lot more about pain and its refining influence. My heart has been drawn out to our Savior, as I have tried to imagine the extent of his suffering, my mortal mind simply cannot comprehend how he took upon himself 
all the pains, all the sins, all the anguish, and all the afflictions of everyone who has ever lived. We revere the babe of Bethlehem precisely because he later offered the incomprehensible, infinite sacrifice in the Garden of Gethsemane and on the cross of Calvary. This offering redeems each of us as we choose to repent and follow him. Then as his crowning act on earth, he rose from the tomb on the third day, granting each one of us the unprecedented blessing of resurrection and life after death. Next, this comes from the talk by President Dallin H. Oaks. Most scriptural accounts of the atonement concern the Savior's breaking the bands of death and suffering for our sins. In his sermon recorded in the Book of Mormon, Alma taught these fundamentals, but he also provided our clearest scriptural assurances that the Savior also experienced the pains and sicknesses and infirmities of his people. Alma described this part of the Savior's atonement. And he shall go forth suffering pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind, and this that the word might be fulfilled which saith, he will take upon him the pains and the sicknesses of his people. Think of it. In the Savior's atonement, he suffered pains and afflictions and temptations of every kind. As President Boyd K. Packer explained, quote, he had no debt to pay, he had committed no wrong, Nevertheless, an accumulation of all of the guilt, the grief and sorrow, the pain and humiliation, all of the mental, emotional, and physical torments known to man, he experienced them all." End of quote. This next quote from President Henry B. Eyring. It will comfort us when we must wait in distress for the Savior's promised relief that he knows from experience how to heal and help us. The Book of Mormon gives us the certain assurance of his power to comfort, and faith in that power will give us patience as we pray and work and wait for help. The Savior could have known how to succor us simply by revelation but he chose to learn by his own personal experience. And finally, President Jeffrey R. Holland. Now I speak very carefully, even reverently, of what may have been the most difficult moment in all of this solitary journey to atonement. I speak of those final moments for which Jesus must have been prepared intellectually and physically, but which he may not have fully anticipated emotionally and spiritually. That concluding descent into the paralyzing despair of divine withdrawal when he cries in ultimate loneliness, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The loss of mortal support he had anticipated, but surely he had not apparently comprehended this. Had he not said to his disciples, Behold, the hour is now come that you shall be scattered, every man to his own, and leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. The Father hath not left me alone, 
for I do always those things that please Him. Indeed, it is my personal belief that in all of Christ's mortal ministry, the Father may never have been closer to His Son than in these agonizing final moments of suffering. Nevertheless, that the supreme sacrifice of His Son might be as complete as it was voluntary and solitary, the Father briefly withdrew from Jesus the comfort of His Spirit, the support of His personal presence. It was required. Indeed, it was central to the significance of the Atonement that this perfect Son, who had never spoken ill, nor done wrong, nor touched an unclean thing, he had to know how the rest of humankind would feel, us, the rest of us, when we did commit such sins. For His Atonement to be infinite and eternal, He had to feel what it was like to die not only physically but spiritually, to sense what it was like to have the Divine Spirit withdraw, leaving one feeling totally, abjectly, hopelessly alone. Why? So that you and I would never need to be left alone. We would always have His power to turn to and draw upon and access. There have been so many prophetic voices, so many prophetic visions of what Jesus Christ accomplished and what comes from His infinite suffering and His, His Atonement that we have a veritable sea of witnesses, a flood of witnesses out there. And it's my hope that this week, as you individually or collectively prepare to celebrate Easter and that glorious resurrection, that you won't have it be just a little uh, holiday with treats on Sunday morning, but rather that it will be a week where you immerse yourself in the scriptures and the words and the testimonies of God's prophets testifying of these incredible events. In King Benjamin's words, how knoweth a man the master whom he has not served and who is a stranger unto him and who is far from the thoughts and the intents of his heart? Hopefully this week the Lord Jesus Christ will not be a stranger to any of us, nor far from the thoughts and the intents of our heart. Hopefully this week, of all the weeks of the calendar year, we can be thinking of Him every day and pondering what He was going through leading up to His infinite atonement that He offered to us in Gethsemane through the trials and onto the cross of Calvary and into the tomb to then be gloriously resurrected on Easter morning. In closing, I want to add my testimony to that sea of witnesses that exists. I know that Jesus Christ was born, that He lived a perfect life, that He taught, He healed, everything in His life pointed people and us forward to his great and last sacrifice. I know that he took upon himself my sins, my death, my mortal weaknesses, all of the effects of the fall that I experience and that you experience. And I know that he rose triumphant from the grave on that first Easter morn and he sits enthroned in yonder heavens on the right hand of the Father, and He is still guiding His church and leading people who are willing to listen to Him, both collectively through the voices of His prophets 
and individually through revelation that we're willing and able to receive. And I know that he's doing this because of his infinite love for us that came because of his infinite suffering for us. I love him with all my heart, and I leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Know that you're loved. Thank you.